So, I know, of course. Thank you guys all for coming out tonight, you know, and braving the cold weather. Um, but uh, we're so happy to have you all here, especially for the exhibition of reparations mm -hmm. featuring the amazing artists Charles Spare and Jim D'Amato. And um, I think for the format of this, I was going to just ask some questions, keep it very conversational, and then wanted to open it up to, to you guys at the end um, to ask anything that you guys wanted to. to. Um, so, one of, uh, I guess, the first question that I would like to ask you for everybody is one, how we got here and everything. You know, um, I have known Chels for some years now and I've worked with her quite a bit, and Jim I've known also for a few years now. And through Proxy, I've worked. I know you two have been in similar shows together, but coming to the point where you have the understanding of wanting to put on a dual, you know, show, you know, two person show. Um, like how did you guys want to have that conversation and then come to that, you know, decision? You go first. I go first? <laughs> you okay. go first. <laughs> um, well, Jen and I have been in a few group shows together over the years, so we had already sort of seen um, the interesting sort of echo that happens when our works are come together. And we just are in the same sort of circle of friends and um, have got to know each other even more over the last few years, and we just started talking about um, working together, and just um, things just sort of very organically and naturally started to happen. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. What she said is true. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, so ju just to go into a little bit more detail on how it all took place, originally we were in a benefit auction show together, and we met briefly, uh, and I remember meeting Chelsea, and I remember she was, she was pretty striking when I met her. She's a striking girl. Um, but I, I, I remember she definitely had a presence, and I liked her work, and she liked my work. Um, but we didn't really talk that much that night, but, but we both, you know, left an impression on each other. Um, and we stayed in touch, and, you know, we, you know, social media and all that. Um, it's the one good thing about social media, uh, you know. But um, Chelsea then had a show at uh, the Louise Nevison Chapel. In Midtown, which she invited me to, and she gave me a tour of it, and I was really impressed by it. I mean, it was it was very very serious. I mean, the pieces in the in the group show, um, the benefit auction. You know, there were smaller works, right? You can't really tell what an artist is up to from just one piece. But uh, when I saw that show, <laughs> I was I was very impressed, um, and I knew she was uh, she was serious about what she was up to. Um, so we, we just hung out more and more um, after that, went to each other's shows and things like that. And, you know, it, it, I think I was the first one that said, hey, we should do something together. Like, it just seemed obvious. Um, because we do have a lot of similarities in terms of how we um, use materials and how we, you know, push the process and, you know, what, what we're interested in. We're, we come uh, from opposite directions in some ways, but we get to uh, somehow a, a similar result, so it, it made sense. Here we are. <laughs> That's actually great because, uh, um, you know, moving forward with the show, it was serendipitous that, as you can see, you know, kind of the main dominant color themes here are black, white, and red. You know, we've got some fun pinks and grays and other hues involved, but that is really, you know, the color palette for the show. And as it happened, you guys both were working in that style just serendipitously, like coincidentally. That wasn't planned? Or you first, again. <laughs> uh, no, it was not planned. I mean, our studios are, are in London, so we are obviously in Westchester. Westchester, and so it's, you know. No, that's up, that's up <laughs> state to people. That's up <laughs> state to people in Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. The great, the great North. It's like Game of Thrones, you know, North. So well, knowing that, yeah, I um, like that. Do, do these colors, like the, the series that you're both presenting here, that we coalesce together, um, hold significance? Um, I know a bit. I'd love for you guys both to expand on on why these colors in particular were chosen. Um, and so I'd love to, to hear more. You want me to give it a crack? You want me to go first? I'm switch it up. Okay. Or do you want to? You want to go first? No, you go first. <laughs> I'm gonna do this all night. <laughs> um, well, red is one of my favorite colors. And earlier last year, um, I was awarded a fellowship at the National Arts Club and had a big solo exhibition there called A Touch of Red. And it was all inspired by the daily ritual of applying red lipstick. And 
I still had a lot of red paint in my studio and I still love red and so I continued to um, develop new works using red um, and also incorporating white and black and a little bit of pink. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the relationship to colors uh, are, are very important, you know, for me. I mean, with me, my compositions tend to be so uh, complex, right, and intricate. I, I, it's a conscious decision to be minimal with the use of color, right, and to um, just be very aware of what color you're using and why. Uh, red has always played, or, or at least for the last let's say decade plus has been a pretty prominent part of, of my palette. I, it's, it's interesting what happens with me where I'll, I'll use reds and blacks and whites, and then eventually um, I'll have these moments or spurts where there's a very intense color, you know, like the pinks and the purples and things like that, and then I'll bring it back down to black and white, and then that, that will sort of ebb and flow and it'll happen again and again. Um, but again, you know, because the compositions are as complex as they are, I'm purposefully using uh, color very uh, minimally and, and specifically. Uh, there's something that a collector of mine uh, you know, brought up a few years ago, which is pretty interesting in that uh, black, white, and red. Like, so a man originally, apparently, like primitive man saw in black and white, and the first color that they saw was red. So he said that you know, there's something primal, there's something savage about that power. Um, and you know, I agree. Yeah, there is there is an element to my work that is uh, trial and uh, you know primitive in, in some ways, and in others not. But it's you know, well, it's really great because abstract art you know has had a very long history of being known as being very subjective to the eye of the viewer of what's being presented. You know, whether there's an intent for the narrative by the artist presented, and knowing that. Is there an intent with any narrative specifically presented with these works here? Is there something that you, when creating these works and then using these colors, and with cellos, the act of red is very, you know, personal to you, the application, that daily process, Jim, this kind of primal, you know, kind of resonance with, you know, man, with mankind's history. So with the works presented, um, are there specific narratives or, um, uh, stories that you are trying to like manifest and put out, or is it more of a kind of inspiration from just working within the studio and then finding that you know relatory moment when the work you feel is completed and finished? You want to go first? <laughs> Sorry, that was too. <laughs> no, no, you have to answer for both of us. Let's go with this one. Okay. Um, for me, this series was really um, a bit of a breaking point in the sense where I decided I wanted to kind of take a break from these very maximalist um, compositions. Um, the white piece on the wall back there is sort of a touch of maximalist um, and <coughs> a touch of my, my past series. And I really wanted to sort of strip back the layers and pull back and be more minimal with my organic I kind of came up with this um, like credo in, in my studio, basically, like how little can I get away with? Like, how much really needs to be there? When is enough enough? And so that within that context, I think some of these elements became a little bit like self-portraits because I started referencing my own body and there's a lot of like physicality to the actual like making of the work. Um, so a lot of new layers kind of unveiled themselves to me. For sure. I mean, I, I definitely see that in your work, for sure. Um, and for me, there is definitely a narrative. Um, there is not a specific narrative, right? And it's not linear. Um, so there's there's definitely something narrative about it. There's a, there's an embedded narrative, basically, right? And as a viewer, I'm asking you to you know complete it. Right? It's it's a it's a non-objective narrative, which um, is kind of an oxymoron. It's like jumbo shrimp, like it doesn't make much sense, like it's a non-objective narrative, like, but there is, there is, a, there is a narrative in there, but it's not, um, you know, it's not obvious, right, it's not, it's not pictorial. Um, there, there are also pictorial elements in my work, and I play with the idea of a picture plane, and what is pictorial and what is, um, you know, completely abstract, right, and uh, plastic and physical and on the canvas, uh, but there's absolutely a narrative. 
I mean, my, my background is comes from graphic arts and illustration and you know sci-fi movies and you know cartoons and and all that stuff that you know fried all our brains when we were little kids. So that that's all in there. Um, but there's also you know the the hugeness of uh, you know modernist painting and you know guys like Pollock and Kooning and, and all that stuff, all the heavy metaphysical you know fine art stuff. So if you look at that, like two trains colliding into each other. That's that's kind of where I am in terms of sensibility. Um, so the short answer is, yeah, there's, there's definitely narrative in there, uh, but it's up to you what that narrative is. I want to circle back to what you were talking about earlier on references, but just to tie in uh, from what Charles was saying, and I know a bit about your practice, both of your guys' practice are intensely physically demanding in terms of creation, um, whether Charles, you're literally stretching and working with these you know, heavy materials, these heavy wood panels. Jim, a lot of your practice I know is about you know, um, transfer, finding the right composition, killing the darlings as you like to say. Brutal. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, as artists and also with the credo of how little I can get away with, you know, what motivates you to keep going down with, this, with such a physical demanding process? And um, how do, do you feel like that adds to the overall outcome of the work created? You first, again. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Um, I mean, I can't help myself. I, guess. <laughs> <laughs> I can't not. Con I mean, there's just so much for me to discover and explore and um, try to solve or unsolve. Um, I guess, can yeah. you talk a little bit about exactly your process for making for, okay. these works? Yeah. Exposed one and open exactly. this piece, yes. yeah, which is, I yes. believe, the first time you've actually brought that to the foreground. Yes, yeah, that's my first time ever sort of sharing with the viewer a little bit of my process and also um, just letting the wire be free. Yeah. And Jim, with yours, they're so graphic and linear, and I've had so many questions of like, are these, you know, printed out, and it's yeah. all freehand. So please, all freehand, baby. Please elaborate on on your process and how you get to realize these compositions. Right off the dome, just from the gut, you know. No, uh, no map. We just go right in. Just go right in, go to the blank. Keep swimming. Um, yeah, I don't know what I say. I'm a crazy guy. I don't know. Um, no, I mean, look. Uh, for me, uh, drawing is the catalyst of the whole thing formally, right? It all comes out of drawing. I mean, I was like, you know, drawing from the time I was a little kid to now, you know, it's, it's my escape from, uh, you know, reality, right? It's like, I, can, I, I feel very at home in that space, right? Just, you know, and uh, I'm sort of an interesting person in that things that I, I guess, um, maybe uh, intimidate, you know, other artists. Like, I've heard a lot of artists say that, like, the moment of the blank canvas, of the, the not knowing what the composition is going to be, that, that moment of the unknown um, that will sometimes intimidate other artists or creative people, uh, that's when I'm at my most calm. That's the best part for me, the, the, blank, the blankness of it, where it's just me and it, and I can just pull something out of, out of nowhere. Um, so I, I enjoy that, right? And then, so my paintings are sort of a process of just elaborating on that. Um, but they get complicated because I'm, um, 
sort of creating uh, puzzles and problems for myself and then solving those problems. Um, I kind of enjoy doing that just like in life in general, like, I don't know, like if I'm having a conversation with somebody, like maybe I'll ask them a question or I'll challenge them in some way, you know, um, I mean, nothing, nothing too crazy, right? But I'll, but I'll do it in a way to, to push them a little bit to, to get them to see what, what they might say or how they might react. Um, but when I'm painting, I'm doing that with myself. You know, so I'm in there with myself, right? So uh, it's hard to beat yourself, but it can be done, believe me. Um, so it, it's, it, that's sort of what that process is like, right? So I'll make it, it's, it's hard because we're not on one level, I'll, I'll play points in there. So, like, so I'll make a mark, right? Like I'll make a, I'll make a really weird shape, and, and I'll say, oh cool, that, that looks, that's, that's a cool shape, I like that. But I'll put it in a place on the canvas where it's like purposely difficult. Like I already, like I've created a problem for myself. Like two marks into the painting, I'm like, oh shit. Like look what I've done already. And then what I'll do is I'll go back into that mark and I'll make it even more complicated. So I, I'm just, you know, creating layers and layers of um, basically like a labyrinth that I have to figure out the way out. So it's kind of a map, you know. So I'm, I'm creating the map and then using the map to uh, find my way in and out of this thing that I'm creating. If that makes any sense, which I'm sure it doesn't. But anyway, you know, it's all, if, it, if you look at the paintings for long enough, it all becomes clear. Mm -hmm. Oh, that actually leads into something. Does that, that make sense? sense? It, I don't know. Sense. You're the curator. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm just, I don't know, man. You know, I just make these things. One word know. that you know, we've talked and I've, I've also had brought up a lot is, uh, I think that could be ascribed to maybe an overall theme for both practices is tension. You know, uh, cellist, obviously the physicality of the medium, you can physically see, you know, the, the push and the pull and the crackling and some of the paint. You know, with Jim, you know, yours is so graphic and intensely visceral, you know, and in certain cases it's almost overwhelming, yet you have this air where you can't look away, you know, and um, knowing that, like, I wanted to know if you were, if, if that's something conscious that you guys are thinking about when presenting, you know, tension as a means, um, because often these works, how, you know, sometimes it can be very intense to look at, I think all end up in this kind of meditative, you know, state of ecstasy or something that draws you in, so that if you, you know, are consciously thinking about, you know, that while creating, or if that is something that, you know, is important to the practice. Yeah, I mean, for me, it, it's it's all tension. I mean, it's it's all, it's you know, ninety nine point nine 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 percent tension. Now, one little bit, no, it's not one little bit. No, but I mean, it is. I mean, for me, it's like someone was asking me recently, you know, what's the process like of getting it to completion? Um, and it was a person who had no context or you know, didn't know anything about you know art or you know art history or the art world or anything. They were completely far to. And, and I said, you know, basically, it's like inflating a balloon, and you're you're um, blowing into it with as much air as you can, and just before it's about to explode, like right, just before, like a nanosecond before it's going to explode, and like it's done, like it it can't withstand one more dot, one more millimeter worth of paint being marked on that canvas, and when it, when it gets to that point. It's done, and I and I only I know that. I know when I I push it to as, as far as I can. You know, I take it to as, as far of a threshold as I can. You know, bending it just just before it completely explodes, and it has exploded many times. I mean, I've you know I've destroyed many many paintings over the years, and it's, it's horrible. But hey, what are you gonna do? Yeah. Well, I feel like 
kind of from from what Charles said, it seems like in Brother Jim, um, repetition seems to also be kind of a heavy theme in in your practice. Whether it's you know placing things in certain difficult areas and then see how you can figure it out. Charles, you know, with you, you know, using similar deconstructed materials, creating these compositions, um, and just kind of is that something consciously aware? Of? Like if you're doing. You know, everyone says, what, 10,000 hours until you're, you know, a master of what, and obviously that means a lot of repetition. Um, how does repetition play into your, to your practices, or is it something that you are consciously aware of, or is it just, at this point, modus operandi? That's a good question. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Um, I think that um, something happens, like, in the process where the piece often wants more of itself. Like when you make a mark, it wants another of the same. And so it's a bit of a tap dance of like restraint and tension and control um, to decide like, is it too much pattern? Is it in order or not? Um, I think that uh, pattern is, um, can add such an interesting layer to a piece when used I guess I also would want to ask just in point of, you know, one of the most obvious, the physicality and scale of both of your works range, you know, drastically from Jim, your 12 by 12, you know, to Charles, you have, you know, 9 by 11s to then, you know, these much larger pieces. Um, when approaching a work, do you know you want to create a smaller piece or the smaller works often you know, studies or kind of test runs for something that might become larger, or do you, you know, how, how is that resolved for you? Well, may I go first? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, switch, I'm switched up now. I'm going to switch up. No, because I, I didn't answer about repetition. You, you jumped to another question. Um, but, <laughs> well, you think geez, you can I, I mean, geez, John. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm going first this time. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of scale, right, so so Tim Rollins, who was a, a great teacher and a guy I studied with at uh, NSVA, once said to me, don't think about size, think about scale, right? And so you want to have that same amount of scale in the same piece, whether it's, um, you know, uh, a, a three-inch square or a 12-foot square, you know, or whatever. It doesn't matter. Like, you want that sense of space um, in it uh, no matter what. And so that's definitely what I try to do. And just to answer the other question about repetition, I, I feel very similar to how, how you do. Um, it's, uh, there are moments in it where you're sensing a pattern, you know, but, but you, you also are compelled to continue uh, going. But it, it, look, everything's a pattern, right? Everything's math. Like the whole world, the whole universe, it's, it's all math. There's all patterns and everything. So, you know, it's patterns, right? It's all a pattern. Like, you don't want to necessarily make it, uh, you know, overtly about a pattern, but there is an element of pattern in, in absolutely everything. So it's just a matter of how much you're articulating that. So, no matter what the, the scale is. Well, going off of that, um, and then going back to earlier, I know we've already mentioned some references. You know, there's been a long history, especially with an abstract art, whether it's collage or pushing what it means to be a painting, you know, off the canvas, deconstructing it, you know, I know in speaking with both of you, the names of like Eva Hess, Lee Montague, Jack Whitten, um, have been, you know, personal influences or inspirations. Um, can you, do, can you guys speak to some of, you know, those inspirations or where you hope to see your work that you're creating, you know, fall in line with that kind of larger art historical context? And obviously you're not trying to replicate, you're trying to add to the narrative when you're both doing so in such unique, you know, abstract visual languages that you've created um, that are uniquely your own and readily identifiable. And so I'd love to hear more about, you know, your personal inspirations and where, you know, you draw, you know, that creative locus from. You first. Okay. You get the hard questions. <laughs> I try to just when they're a little easier. Easy. When they're a little easier, that's when I speak up with the hard ones. I go first. Uh, sure, no, I'll go first. Um, well, I think <coughs> when I was working. 
reflecting, especially on this series, I was thinking a lot about Louise Bourgeois and how she's so like free and raw with her use of self-portraiture. And so I really admired that. And like in this piece called um, Freedom, I actually painted it when it was, um, it was a, a white like sculptural surface I made. And then I thought, why not just be free with the paint? And so I started to just respond to the shapes on the, on the surface and started to also reference my own body and my <coughs> hands and legs and I kissed the top corner. So um, she's definitely been an influence on me as well as Louise Nevelson and kind of going back to studies and um, like do I make something small or big and why? Um, I don't always make studies, but sometimes um, you don't have time to make a big piece. I do have a two-year-old, so I will just quickly make a small piece before I forget. Um, and some of those are included in um, like the red and white uh, small works over there. And so right now I'm actually thinking a lot about Louise Nevelson and um, <coughs> very influenced by her work in the past with her birth dancers. I'm a ballet dancer, she was a modern dancer and we both use her dance practice to kind of inform our composition and the way we do gravity and navigate our visual spaces. Um, and now I'm making like modular works kind of similar to her in the sense of many smaller works making a larger work. Um, so that's also challenging my use of scale in um, a new way. That's cool. Yeah. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wow, that's, I even got me thinking about something. I got distracted. I started thinking about the next piece that she's going to be doing. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, with, with influences, I mean, they're, they're all in there, right? Um, and I, I do, uh, I, I'm pretty good at uh, being able to uh, see something that I'm attracted to and influenced by, but not letting it uh, overwhelm me. Like, even when I was a little kid, this was pretty strange. Like, when they, they try to teach you how to draw, they usually, uh, especially in the graphic arts, they tell you to copy other uh, artists, right? Like, the comic arts are like, okay, like, go get a you know, copy of Spider-Man or Superman and, and draw that and copy that. And I was always like, no, like, I don't want to copy anyone's work. I want to make my own work. And of course it made my drawings look really weird when I was a kid, like because everybody's shoulders were like really sharp and angular because I couldn't figure out like word shortening or anything like that. But they were original. Um, <laughs> and I sort of like, I'm still that guy. I'm like, no, it's like, I don't want to make it like this guy. I want to make it like my own. But I also can, can look at, at work and, and be, um, you know, and, and absorb it, right? But have it, have it go into my subconscious and then go through a prism and have it come out and, and be something entirely different. Uh, so like I'll often, uh, like if I'm, even if I'm seeing like a film, like it doesn't matter. Like if they, I see a David Fincher film or a Ridley Scott film, like those are, or even Scorsese, you know, they're, they're, they're brilliant. I mean, these guys were all artists, right? So. There are things from even other mediums that will seep their way into my work, an element of the cinematic or something like that, much less uh, somebody like Pollock or Jack Whitten, who I was lucky enough to uh, know personally and be friends with. Um, it's all in there. You know? I mean, I saw a video of Herring the other day, Keith Herring in the subway, and, you know, down in the tubes in 84, 85, and the immediacy of that guy's work was wild. I mean, he, he was furious. I mean, he just went in there, boom, boom, boom. You know, no fear, doesn't matter, like straight from the heart, straight from the gut. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, I get that. Like, I'm, I'm right there. So I'm, I'm, I'm influenced by a lot of different things, but I try to, uh, you know, put it in the back of my mind, clear it all out, get to that blank space, and then just, you know, try to, try to do something new, get, to, get into new territory. Maybe that's why I like the, the blankness so much. I get to, I get to forget. That's the best part. I get to just, you know, get rid of it all. Well, it's interesting you say that because, I mean, the title of the show is called Reverberation, which, you know, can be defined as kind of like a prolonged resonance, you know, or almost like an echo effect. And I think between both of your works, they have such a dialogue and communication. Jim, I feel yours are very visceral, you know, in terms of like the human experience almost. And Chalice, yours can be almost considered like more corporeal, you know, obviously the the physicality of it, but then also, you know, you can't help but notice, especially with these newer bodies of work, the more modern chromatic ones, kind of this hark back to old classicism. Like, is it something that you're looking at, like, you know, ancient Roman or Grecian, um, you know, especially with the first piece we have, um, Fold, and then Fold here, 
um, and the four back there, which you were just alluding to in the sense of creating you know, new bodies of work where individually they stand alone, but like with Louise Nevelson, collectively they are a new whole. Um, is that a consideration? And also I would love to know, um, you know, as a curator, I came into this with reverber reverberation, you know, chosen already. I loved it and I wanted to know how we, how we got here, because I could obviously see the line, but I'll take the one about the title because I came up with the title, right? So should I should I answer that? Or I think you you talk about the classicism and all that. Again, you answer the hard question. I answer the easy question, and everyone will go great. Go ahead, classicism, all that. I don't know. Yes, I mean I um, am definitely influenced by you know, Greek and Roman sculptures, and there's actually one at the Met that's called the Dancer, and she you can like completely see her body and like all the drapes, and it's really just few like key folds and use of gravity that you actually see her body and and reference like her silhouette. So I just find that so fascinating and that it's also often in these really hard materials that they're able to replicate the soft smoothness of fabric. Um, so that kind of kind of like trumpery aspect I think also has um, come through my work and um, different aspects as well. <coughs> So as for the name, as for the name, <laughs> all right, I named this one and I named the one before this, which was a pop-up show called Rejuvenation. Rejuvenation, Reverberation, get the theme, guys. Um, and it, it's just about the dialogue between the two of us. You know, the, the previous one, which was just a very quick pop-up, um, you know, in a great space that we got uh, back in November. You know, just the idea of rejuvenation and that, that our collaboration was rejuvenating to both of us and sort of a rejuvenating force. Um, I also uh, thought that that name was appropriate in terms of rejuvenation in the city, right? Using um, uh, you know spaces in unique ways to you know invigorate the city, and you know uh, artists collaborating that could be a, an act of rejuvenation, um, and this you know being the, the sequel to that, right? Uh, reverberation, you know, focusing more on us, and, and then the uh, reverberations between us as people, as artists you know, aesthetically, personally, and things like that, those connections, and focusing on those. So that was that was the idea being behind the name. Beautiful. Now I'd like to also put, I guess, shift to gears a little more, but, but you both as artists right now, especially, you know, um, and today I wanted to ask you as visual artists, how you feel the presence of like social media and online engagement, you know, how important is that to you as individual artists in your <coughs> own work and how much has you know kind of almost taken over the art world right now with like Instagram and everything, but also you know this this talk itself was pushed out heavily on Instagram and through social media. So I'd love to get you know the artist take on you know dealing with online presence and social media and how important you feel like that is to your practice, if at all it is. It's a hard question. You get it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was trying to make these easy. <laughs> Give me the softballs, man. All right. Um, I mean, I feel like social media and everything, I mean, there's a loss and gain with everything. And I feel like um, as a visual person, I kind of appreciate the visual quality of Instagram. Like, I think it helps me remember things when I'm also dyslexic. So I remember pictures much better than I do names. Um, and I feel that it's just a great, like, marketing tool. And when you're able to out a way to integrate it into your practice that isn't driving you crazy. It can be very helpful. Um, but it's, yeah, it's an interesting kind of layer into our society. And I mean, as you can see, my work is all made by my hands. My work's very tactile, and I'm very much about the human experience and human connection and human touch. Like, that's a big part of my practice is taking a break from the split screens and just immersing yourself in raw material. So I have kind of like mixed feelings about social media in a way, but I also see it as a resourceful tool at the same time. I totally agree. I mean, um, you know, so when we got photographs of, of the opening back, which Anna was here tonight, so great photographs. Shout out to Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. She gets the applause for me. 
But, um, but anyway, the, the, the thing about it, which was amazing to me, was how photogenic these were. I mean, all of the, the works were, were photogenic, but there were a lot of great shots of people standing in particular in front of these red paintings. And I was like, wow, they're so photogenic. Like, they're just, and they read, like when you see them in person, I mean, at least for me, you know, they're so physical, they're so personal. I'm reading them and, and, and dealing with them on a, on a physical level, but just uh, <laughs> visually and graphically, they were like, super photogenic. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. Um, and for me, like, I think what happens sometimes, um, and I crop a lot of the stuff that I put up online, like sometimes I don't want any border or anything around it. I just want you to deal with the image. That's it. Um, but in, in some ways, it, that might be a hindrance because people are not sure, like they're like, is this, um, is it digital? Like, how did, how did you do this? And it's only when they see it in person sometimes, or people who know my work, where they're like, you know, holy shit, these are made by hand, like these are, these are, you know, these are actual physical objects. And to me, I don't really know that because I know I made them by hand, so it's like, it's obvious. No, it's not Illustrator, like I did it. Like, this is not Photoshop, like I made this but that's not always obvious to people. Um, so, you know, you have to keep them. I don't know, I, 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 I can't relate to other people. I don't know what's going on in other people's heads. <laughs> I, I have no idea, uh, you know? So I'm not the guy to ask, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you, you get it, right? Yes. Yeah, this is why we need you, man. <laughs> because you, you take our thoughts, you help, and the people, everybody understands it, that's great. Uh, but that's, yeah. So I kind of love it and hate it too, which I think is my answer, I think. Well, yes. I've got, one more question, and I'd love to open it up to the audience. Um, you know, uh, we spoke earlier on, you know, kind of how we got here about your cellist. You've had a very exciting last couple of years from the Solar Museum show, the National Arts Club Fellowship, being in multiple group shows, Jim being in multiple group shows, developing these new bodies of work, and then like really cohesively kind of like putting them down. I don't really know like what's next. You kind of alluded to it a bit on current projects, but is there anything in the work or where would you like to see, you know, your practice take that next step towards? Or I want to know, you know what, I'll take this one. And there was, all, there was also the secret project, which you guys saw, which no one else has seen. Well, one person in this audience has seen it. I don't know if I was allowed to reveal that. No, you can't. You can't reveal it. Can't reveal it. So it's a secret project that in the pandemic, which has not seen the line of, of day, but it will. I feel like it's a secret. It's a, it's a secret. It's a secret. Well, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a project. It's under wraps. So there was a collaborator involved. Very good. I'm sorry, to sound like Trump. Very good collaborator. Fantastic collaborator. But we, but, but we, we couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't crop it because of COVID and everything. And just the world, the world, the world, the world is not ready for it. Do a full on Trump impression here. No, but anyway, there was a secret project in the works, and I would like to see that secret project come to life eventually at the right time. Um, and I have other stuff that I'm, that I'm dreaming up. Um, you know, um, the same guy in this crowd who has seen that project, we talk about crazy ideas, he happens to be a collector of mine. And you know, look, I mean, I, I'd love to have my Julian Schnabel moment when I'm, I'm walking around in my pajamas and, and, and make a film, you know, that'd be amazing. Um, you know, gotta get, gotta get some money in, you know, in the wallet first before we, we do all that and make a film that costs a lot of money. But that would that would be amazing to do to work in other mediums. Um, oh, and, other mediums. You no, know, potentially. Like I could see. Yeah, I mean, I could see. Th I could see it grow. Like the way Schnabel has taken painting and has translated what he can do in painting into filmmaking. <laughs> I think that's incredible. I mean, this is like top of the mountain zenith type stuff. Um, but would would I love to do that at some point in my life? Sure. Um, in terms of the paintings themselves. I mean, I went to see Anselm Kiefer at Gagosian uh, a few weeks ago. I mean, and they were enormous. They were paintings that were the size of buildings. I mean, it was incredible. So if, if you have the resources and you allocate the resources, anything is possible. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, give, give me a few mil, I'll start making paintings in an airplane hangar too. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, whatever. Like like the scale is something. But I mean, yeah, I, I mean, listen. Sword. I mean, the damn painting's bigger than my apartment. I mean, it's absurd. I mean, it was it was wild, you know. So I would I would love to I'd love to do all that, you know. Sure, but, you know, Julian Schnabel style, right? Huge paintings, films, pajamas, the whole, the whole thing. And tell us. Um, tough to top. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard. Tough to top. 
She's the same. It's the same, it's the same for her. Leave you on that way. Okay. <laughs> Sculptures are really cool, by the way. The sculpture, you gotta keep making sculpture. Yeah, you just gotta keep. I know it's a pain in the ass. Sculpture's tough, guys. You know, but uh, you know it's just generally right. But but you gotta keep making it because they're they're. I really like them a lot. So. Thank you. Yeah, I have on a display right now at the gallery in Lower East Side called Trotter and Troller. Um, it's up through the second week of February. Um, so yeah, if you don't, please take a look. And that's all. So, I'd love to at this time to open uh, questions up to the audience now. Yeah, ask us questions, guys. Charles, uh, Charles, you alluded to on your dance background having an, an impact on your work and the way that sort of gravity and tension and stretching um, is a part of your process. I would love to, I'm really interested in that dance background of yours, and I'd just love to learn more about how that's sort of a part of your daily practice. Yes, yeah, so um, I've been dancing since I was five. And I think initially it was just a way for my mom to try to get into trouble. She just took me to dance class like five days a week. Um, and I did it all through high school. And then when I got to college, I was like, well, I'm not going to the gym. I'm just going to go dance. So I just continued my dance practice um, even at MC and at Brown. And um, I take swing dancing classes there all the time. We travel and I rely on dancing. And um, then when I moved to New York, I found ballet again. And, and that class can be. Um, and so often my dance teacher will even say things to me like recently we were working on step over turns mm -hmm. and she was like when you're turning replace yourself with yourself and she just started yelling that at me because <laughs> I wasn't doing it fast enough essentially but there was something within that process that I was like that's so fascinating like that is kind of what you're doing you're building new muscles for yourself you're replacing yourself with the, a better version of yourself as you continue to So anything from something kind of um, metaphoric in my practice will influence me to something like very literal, like um, just from even like the palette of black and white, or I, I usually wear like black tights, maybe a white leotard or and my red lipstick, or it could be even just the way I'm turning in space or lifting my leg. And um, when I'm physically making the work as well, there's like, a lot of like moving around and maneuvering the fabric and tucking and folding and twisting and putting the, the first panel on the floor, putting it on the wall and then turning it upside down. You know, there's a lot of physicality that, that happens as well. I love that about how you're wearing a, a black tights, a white leotard, and a red lipstick. Yeah. It's like you're the embodiment of these paintings. Yeah. <laughs> and they are of you. Yeah, you more like your work. Yeah, yeah. There is a similarity. In a way, uh, you could describe each of these as a self-portrait. Oh, yes. yeah. uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Your work's very personal. Like when I see your work in person, it's not, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very personal. You're, you, you're very courageous. Thank you. <laughs> to build on that, there is such a commonality of movement throughout both of your works in, in their own unique way, and also to that point curator as well, just watching the storytelling that's going on in each corner. I've been looking at this corner now for quite a bit, referential of your work, and then certainly the one over there, so through the eye in right away. So you've talked a little bit about the motion, but so often I think visual artists struggle with that, getting that energy of motion to convey off the boundaries of the canvas of the medium. Put you on the spot. Thank you. You can go first this time. Take the tails. Right. Um, yes, no. There is a lot of movement in both of the works here, and it 
was very fun coming in for installation, you know, you know, laying everything out and seeing, you know, like any project you might have ideas going in on where certain pieces might go, but as I always like to say, there's no definitives, everything's always a conversation, you know, so let's see how it looks and let's move things around. And, you know, it was uh, such a, you know, blessing working with such not only great artists, but also very great people um, in a sense where we were all very collaborative in, you know, showing the works that we knew that we wanted to show and then spacing them out and pairing them where we thought each would really elevate, you know, the surroundings. So as you said, there are, you know, individual moments within the exhibition as a whole that kind of resonate more with each other, you know, um, uh, you know, the, from the first two pairings to the left of the title sign, I thought, you know, those just kind of really drew your eye in after you kind of come come in. You've got Jim's three beautiful works, right? You know, right on the white that set the tone for like, you know, the overall color palette. Um, uh, and you know, going from 224 to a 23, even though there's a small difference, it kind of visually leads the eye in um, to obviously, you know, our letterhead. And then as you would then move around, I guess the show would be designed or it was curated to move in a counterclockwise. You know, you would start and then kind of work your way, work your way through. Um, and then obviously we've got these, you know, incredible statement pieces that we kind of knew needed to be directly across from the window. So when people are, you know, walking past the eye, it's no surprise red is, you know, really catches people. I think that's why people who drive red cars have more speeding tickets than people <laughs> who drive red cars. Um, but then again, moving, yes, and with Jim's work, you know, uh, one thing we didn't actually get to talk too much about, but I'd love you to maybe expand if there's time, how many different subtle colors that you put underneath, because there is red and rose and flesh tones within these kind of gray hues that then, you know, setting against really you know, elevate, I think, both pieces moving around the corner to that, that beautiful pink corner. I mean, that, that piece I'm looking at, straight ahead, the 12 by 12, is just so energetic. It just, you know, it's magnetic in a sense, next to Chelsea's sweeping kind of, you know, more ethereal tone and use of pink. And I thought combining those together can kind of show not only the versatility of the color pink, which can often be, you know, just reduced to almost a gendered color. And it's so much not, you know, I don't think any color is exclusive to any sort of, you know, gender or narrative. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, moving around, going back into, you know, another a lighter, kind of more ethereal, I thought, took these corners that are just so beautiful in this gallery layout with Highline 9, these spaces are just, you can't ask for a better gallery, you know, than, than these, they're immaculate. Um, so light filled, beautifully rendered, um, and then, to these two right here behind us, I, you know, this was this was the most fun kind of wall to to curate. Um, there was some topic of other things going on, but I thought those those worked well together, um, and I think I, I've been very happy with how it, it turned out. I hope you guys have um, also. And then um, you know, as then you continue on, you get more towards you know. Again, we talk scale. Those weren't studies. Everything you, you see small was never really kind of a smaller version of a larger work. It was maybe working out some things that turned in larger with like the red pieces, you know, further, but those were, you know, combined to become two, which I know the top one was, you know, an early thought for fold right behind us here. Um, but yeah, I guess cohesively, I think that's what I wanted the movement so it wasn't as overwhelming. Everyone fears you don't want to overhang, you know, but also knowing how much, you know, gravity and weight each of these pieces hold, I really wanted everything to breathe. Um, but again, as I said, it's always a conversation and laying things out, um, collaboration. So, I hope you guys enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll chime in just a, just a couple things, because Josh is not gonna brag about himself, right? But the first day that I was here, okay, alone in the gallery, you know, a, a woman walked in who, you know, looked like she was worth $10 million, right? And she was looking at all of the works and she stopped at this wall and she said, the curation, the curation. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I was like, but the paintings, right? <laughs> you like the paintings too, don't you? 
And she's like, no, but the curator, the curator. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah John's awesome. Okay, thanks. And I was like, do you want to sign our book? And it's just, just like that. Yeah, so, whatever. And so we suck. It's all about John. Uh, was that your mom? But, uh, it was a plan. You planned it somehow. No, it was good. And it was like literally the first person I saw. I was like, okay, cool. this is going well. This is fantastic. This is fantastic. This is fantastic. Uh, but but the, these works, guys, right? So Josh, and, and, and we know Josh, right? He's, he's not a heavy handed guy. He's, he's diplomatic. He, he listens to everybody. He was very insistent that these two pieces be hung together uh, on the same wall. And, you know, Charles and I agreed, like, we. We unwrapped them, we, we saw them, and you know, we were like, okay. And then when we hung them, we realized the name of Charles's piece is freedom, and the name of my piece is revolution. Oh, wow. <laughs> How about that? And then also, uh, these pieces here, um, the pink and the purple pieces, Charles and I made those pieces at a similar time, but we did not know that. We didn't know we were each making work um, mm -hmm. with that power, right? You know, studio, uh, Charles's studio is in, uh, one level city, mine is in Westchester, and they basically both kind of manifested at the same time. But we had no knowledge of them uh, basically until until they were made. Um, and then last but not least, so this wall, which I really have to give a ton of credit to to Josh on, we we knew. So I I was the guy who was kind of like, look, I I think we should have some smaller pieces of the show. Like I know Chelis, right? It's like. She's super organized, like everything's gonna be big. Like I knew that it was gonna be some, like months ago, I was like, there's gonna be some crazy shit, and it's gonna be some giant paintings, and it's gonna be some giant red stuff, and materials, and it's gonna be nuts, and I'm gonna have to make 100 paintings, you know, just to like, you know, be relevant. And I was like, all right, well, I want, I said to Chelsea, I said, look, I want us to have some smaller pieces in the show too. And she's like, okay, I agree. So, but we didn't know what we wanted, so. Here was my, my idea. I said, look, let's bring more than less of the smaller works. And basically, you know, we'll figure it out, right? We'll figure it out. Well, who's gonna figure it out? Josh is gonna figure it out. <laughs> so we, we, we hung the show, right? And we were really happy. We were like three quarters of the way there. And then we got to the, to the wall, which was basically gonna be for the small works. And Josh said to me, he said, Jim, I wanna hang your work in a grid. And I was like, no, no. I don't want to, I hate grids. And the reason I hate grids is because I was on a show 10 years ago in Miami with a bunch of small paintings on a grid. However, all of the paintings were not exactly the same size and the wall was warped and was not level. So that was, it was a fucked up grid, guys, let me tell you. Uh, so since then, I was traumatized by the grid. I don't want to do the grid, I hate the grid. The grid is my worst enemy. And Josh said, trust me, he talked to me like I was a child. <laughs> this is a new grid. The only way to talk yeah. to go, have a, go, go have a little sandwich and come back and everything is going to be okay. And, and, and I was like, okay. And I left the gallery and I came back and the grid was there and the grid was amazing. And I was like, holy shit. And, and then Josh was like, all right, well now we have to sort of figure out Chelsea's work. And, but Chelsea, I'm going to tell you guys, there are pieces that didn't make the cut for this show that Chelsea had that are, I'm gonna curse, they're fucking awesome. I'm gonna tell you this right now. There's some shit you didn't see. Both, yeah, I yeah. say. Yeah, Both but, well, but, the one, but the one of mine that didn't make the cut, it, it was all right. We, we sort of, you and I sort of, no, you, but you and I sort of put our heads together and said, you know what, those make sense for the grip. That was easy. But there are a couple of pieces of Chelsea's that are really awesome, that didn't make the cut, and, and Josh was like, all right, we gotta figure out what we're gonna do with this wall. And I was like, who cares? And I was like, just pick one of them. They're all great. Like, whatever, throw it on there, dude. And he's like, no, no, no. And and Chelsea's like, well, Josh, it's up to you. And I tried to like chime in with my suggestions or whatever, but I'm done. The grid is done. And then Josh had a moment. This was a crazy thing. He had, you know, the tarp laid out, and he had like 12 of Chelsea's works. And he's like figuring out in his mind which ones to hang up. And I was like, oh, fuck it, I'm just gonna leave him alone. Like, I'm not even gonna talk to him. And I, I left for like an hour, and I don't know what you did, I don't know what happened. But I came back and we decided, and Josh had decided on those works, and I was like, oh my God. They're amazing. Yeah, because it is so like, it is so sequential, it is so narrative, it is so cinematic. And it's just like, it's, it's amazing to me because it's like those, that wall is about all the other pieces somehow, but it's also about itself. 
And like that, the lady, you know, my, my favorite person who came in, she, she actually said she was like, each wall is like its own show. She still doesn't have the book, but, you know, but she, she said that. Hopefully she'll be back. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully she'll be back. But what I'm saying is, and it's true, right, it's like that, that wall is its own show. Like those three of mine there, like I feel like that. But, but yet, and, you know, this is its own thing, so like, there's a lot of shows, guys, in this show, is my point. So. Oh, yeah. And then some. <laughs> we probably didn't. We probably didn't. But I just wanted to share all that because Josh is not going to brag about himself. But I thought it was I thought it was actually really amazing and I was completely impressed by it. Um, and it's not a skill that I have, right? It's like it's it's its own skill to be able to decipher. Like literally, I would have taken the piece of yours that I just like the best, and I just would have hung it, and I'd be like, yeah, the purple one. Like whatever, you know. Like I wouldn't have put that much thought into it. Stay there, like stay there. I'd have been like, pick the maroon one. I don't know. You know but, but it was it was. Are there any other questions? Come on, guys, give us some do, good stuff. Do you know the titles of both of them when you put them there? Oh, no. Oh, it's great, because you did out of the spirit. I did, but I wasn't going to use <laughs> titles as a way to right, get of course you know, because right. titles can be, you know. I'm sure. I was just curious. Cause very, was... yeah. <laughs> but um, I didn't know that you knew that. No, but I'm in that moment though. I didn't, you know, I knew that you, I knew you knew what the titles were, but I didn't know in that moment we were like these have to go together. I didn't know. So what's next? Come on, guys. What's next? We got some ideas. We're gonna talk to you. We're gonna talk to you about what's next. No, we're 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 we're, we're thinking uh, we're thinking of some other things. You know, someone came to us uh, recently. There there have been opportunities that have come up because of the show. Um, so someone came to us recently with an opportunity which could be which could be really cool. Um, and we're we're gonna say we can't. Well, one thing I wanted to ask that I haven't actually asked you guys yet. Um, do you guys have a favorite piece of the show? I always like asking every artist that. Like, of one or of that... the other artists? Uh, <laughs> Wasn't gonna go there, but answer your yeah, answer however you would like. But I would like to know like if there's a particular piece in this show that has any you know s significance, maybe more so than the others, to you. Question. It's like picking a favorite child. <laughs> So for me, um, so it's, it's all about this wall. I mean, they're, they're all of the, the work here, uh, they, they all, um, you know, resonate with me for one reason or another, but 
So that piece there, uh, it, it became what it was supposed to be. Um, so there's always a, a varying degrees of clarity with which I'll see uh, the work in my mind while I'm making it, right? Sometimes it's, it's uh, totally blank or sometimes it's fuzzy and sometimes it's like very cr crystalline and clear. And that painting went through the whole progression where at first it was, I didn't, I didn't see anything. I had no idea what the hell I was doing when I started the painting. And then it, it uh, came into itself and uh, it crystallized and it, it became what it was supposed to be. This one too, I like this one too. Uh, the reckoning, you know. And there is some, just to answer your question from like three hours ago, uh, there, is some, there is some reds uh, mixed into those grays. So in, in, the gray, in every one of my gray paintings that you'll see here, um, they're all a different shade of gray, and like you can um, you can work for a lifetime just with uh, the tonalities of gray and the different values in, in gray. So there's a little bit of red in there. Uh, that's a different gray. That's a different gray. They're all different grays. Um, yeah. So for me, it's those. And um, for cellist's pieces, I mean, obviously these are uh, <laughs> these are loaded with uh, scale and ambition, and they make me think of uh, Clifford Still and you know, post-war painting and, and all that, and you know, Barna Newman, and you know, there's a, there's a million connotations with these paintings, but just for me personally, uh, that painting is just like lovely and aesthetically, and there is, there's a lot of, uh, there is a lot of freedom in that painting, and there's a lot of looseness, and it is, uh, there's something painterly and, and lyrical going on about it, so it just, personally, if I had to steal one, <laughs> am I, am I, am I, we know they're not going to now. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's all gone. That's what I'm saying. I mean, these, these to me, they, you know, they're, they're, they're very bold. They're very, you know, the, the cellist stamp. You know, it's sort of like, you know, those three are to these three, right? It's like you see those three of mine, and you're like, all right, you're, you're in there with Jim now. Like, you're in his world. And that's what, what these were about for you, I think. And then everything else is the dialogue uh, between us. But yeah, that's, to me, to me, that's the goal. And everyone, when they come in and see the show, it's interesting to watch people come in and, and look and look and look. And then they get to this wall, and then they're, they're, they're frozen right there. Because they realize that they're definitely some light. Everything that they've been thinking as they've been going around the room, they're trying to figure it out, that, that uh, makes sense. You know, they're, they're certain of that by the time they come around. So that's just, that's interesting for, for me to, to see and check out. So. Well, are there any other questions? I mean, we've got a lot of alcohol for you guys. All <laughs> yeah, yes. I mean, I mean, yeah, there is, there is plenty of guys, so you can hang out for a little bit afterwards. Come on, yeah. one more question, anybody? Come on. Well, I want to ask a question. The cheap Avengers. <laughs> ask, yeah, is it a hard question? Let me ask her. Well, do you have an answer uh, how she was scared to think that the, the sculpture or the painting is going to be much bigger than when you start. What, what makes you decide the size? Well, I mean, it really all comes back to statement, and like what I feel the piece needs um, to better express itself. Um, so sometimes I just know that it needs to be bigger. Um, in the event that I don't have like time to start on something bigger, I will make like smaller studies, especially if I'm trying to figure out It tells you, basically. It tells me. I don't usually do a lot of drawing. I do some drawing. Um, and I I do a lot of like writing while I'm making the works. Like I'll write a lot of different titles or descriptions for myself. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I'll do like just lots of studies on the on like how I made the paint. Like I wrote down the formula for this rest. <laughs> I won't forget. Um, this is different from all the other rest I've done, actually. Um, and then actually looked back at my sketchbook um, and there was like a version of the sketch that I had done like maybe five years ago mm -hmm. and it was sort of like I kept trying to get here and I couldn't get there yet so then it was like I had to do all of this to move forward. Mm -hmm. You both work um, of course on paper too so if you guys yes. haven't had a chance there's a, a beautiful portfolio over there with um, uh, works on paper, and I know 
Uh, we haven't talked too much about those. Yeah. Um, there are some prints by Jim as well as unique works in Chelsea. I mean, yours are all kind of more collage, painterly, all unique as well. So I didn't know if you guys wanted to talk briefly about working on paper yeah. at the end, sorry. I'll take this one. All right. <laughs> I'm a drawing guy. Uh, yeah, I mean, so listen, you know, drawing is the catalyst for everything for me. It's all coming out of drawing. Uh, so by the time I get to the paintings, it's, it's muscle memory. I'm, I'm ready to go. You know, I'm, I'm working hard in those drawings, and the drawings are, you know, fully realized uh, works, right, onto themselves. I'm not, I'm not a study guy. I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a finished work guy. So, um, you know, we wanted to have some works on paper, too, uh, just to, again, to have, you know, a smaller work. You know, it, it can be an entry point for, for someone who uh, doesn't, uh, maybe doesn't know our work yet, uh, but it's also just a great way uh, to see what we're, we're really about. Uh, I'm in one particular collection, and this collector just has drawings. It's all drawings that she has. It's crazy. It's like, I can't get her to buy a painting to save my life. But it, it's because she's very connected to drawings, and most of the artists that she collects, um, she feels that drawing is the way to get to know uh, their body of work as, as artists. And it's very true. You know, drawings are very intimate, and uh, you're, you're very close to the artist's mind and practice and imagination. So uh, I thought it was important to have some drawings in there. Um, I did do an addition, just an addition of 12 of archival inkjet uh, additions, uh, just to have them show, which is based on a drawing. Uh, but again, you know, you know, same kind of thing, right? There, there's, a, there's a thread for me between drawing, printmaking, painting, like it's all, it's all part of the same thing. And I think the monotypes that you have in, in the portfolio, they're really cool. I mean, there's a lot of light and a lot of space in them, and they're, they're, they're paintings. They feel like paintings because they have the physicality of, you know, your larger works. But it's interesting because they're forced to be two-dimensional. Something interesting happens in your work when you force it to be two-dimensional. Like I kind of like it. <laughs> like I like your sculpture, right? Because it's like it's just a sculpture. Like that's it. You have to feel the sculpture. But the fact when you do it and it's just two-dimensional, it's cool because you still have to get all that that physical stuff uh, into it, and it's there. So. Works on paper, guys. Hold on, works on paper. <laughs> they can be yours, I'm saying. It's kind of fun. Talk to, talk to Sophie. How are works on paper created for you? Yeah, so um, the works on paper that we selected for this were uh, all modern types that I made. So they're made with pigments of beeswax. So I mix dried pigments with beeswax on a hot plate. It's sort of like a cousin to encaustic, it's a printmaking process. And then I How do you dry anything else aside from what you do? Something completely different? You're talking about uh, stylistically? Yeah, or stylistically. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I mean, well, I, I, oh, you want me to take this one? You tell me. <laughs> well, you want to take it or you want to take it? Well, I mean, I just, well, speak, speaking for myself, I mean, you know, we, we just, you know, we are who we are, right? I mean, it's like, if, if you look back at, you know, older works of mine, and, you can see how it went from something else to what this has become. Mm -hmm. But for me, it would just be an exercise at this point. Like if I was going to, I don't know, draw the finger or something, or work in a palette that was um, something that I wouldn't do normally. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, that would kind of be interesting. Like I could see myself going, all right, I'm gonna make a yellow one. You know, but, but so still, like changing up one variable, like changing up a, a major ingredient in the recipe uh -huh. and still making a similar dish. Like I can see myself doing that, but it's like I'm not necessarily going to make a completely different dish just for the sake of doing it. Uh -huh. Like I, I don't know. Like I'm not, I'm not into the idea necessarily of uh, change for change's sake. Like I think when artists do that, it's kind of a trap. Like I don't, I don't get that where it's like, I don't know, like a musician, like one album sounded, like three albums sounded one way, and now the, the, the next album sounds completely different. Like you, you, you change for change's sake. 
like change if if uh, the change is real and the change is appropriate. Yeah. Okay. That's bad. So. Yeah. And I mean, I think um, it's it's natural for artists to go through different periods or interests, and they kind of evolve and, and push their work in different ways. I mean, my background is is really rooted in textiles. Like I'm from a small textile town in South Carolina, and I studied textiles at Rhode Island School of Design, and then I moved to New York um, and worked as a designer. And I was always painting and drawing on the side, but it was also very connected to textiles. So um, I've definitely gone through different phases, and I've become more confident and more bold in my approach to textiles. Um, I would say the only thing I've done that kind of maybe changes my medium a little bit is in the Touch of Red, I did offer a photograph um, that was an addition of pride, and it was an image of my lips that was very abstract. Um, and I incorporated a little bit of that photograph in this piece back here. It was a black and white one. It's called Hitchcock. Um, the texture in that piece actually is a little bit of the imagery in my lips. And I love Hitchcock's dramatic use of camera angles and, um, and it's in black and white because it's sort of like a nostalgia for a kiss, almost like that kind of dizzying effect that a kiss can have on you and that sort of um, sense of motion. And there's wow. a transfer. Uh, yeah, this photo transfer. On top of the... On top of the, the sculptural form and then I continue to drape fabric on top of that. So that, that piece has sort of three different What else? One more, and we're closing it up. Come on, come on, people. Let's go. You in the back, you got anything? Come on, no? Uh, all right. Who inspires you? Uh, this is a good one. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go, all right, we'll, 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 we'll each answer, and we'll, we'll, we'll end on that. Yeah, well, I think we've talked a little bit about it. Like, I, there's tons of artists that inspire me, from Jack Whitten to um, Barnett Newman, Louise Nevelson, um, I mean, there's so many dance influences for me from Martha Graham to the Bell Machine, and I love old movies, like I'm a big Leslie Berkeley fan. Um, I love Peter Sellers and all the Pink Panthers, like I can't help but think of him when I was working in pink. You know, there's so many different references that come up. I also love fashion, so from Hermes to Chanel, like there's different quotes that For sure. Yeah, I mean, like, same here. Right? You, you want to be open to anything that, that's good. It's about sensibility. That's like what I was talking about before. You know, I could see, uh, I could watch 2001 A Space Odyssey and, uh, you know, and, and, and pull things from that. Or I could, uh, I could go to MoMA and I could, uh, you know, pull things from that. You just got to have the, the antenna up for, for all this stuff. It's not about one uh, artist in, in particular. You can go out into nature and you can just, you know, go into the forest for, for a long time and you can start to sense things and feel things that you can bring into your work. Like nature is the predominant influence for, for everyone, really. I mean, it's all going through a filter into another medium, but, you know, time, space, the unknown. Well, we, we just got it. We just were asked a question about that. We did some press recently and they asked, you know, basically what our, our uh, inspiration uh, was and, you know, what, you know, what compels us. And I was like, but my answer was, you know, the unknown, what, what uh, we can't see, what we can only imagine. Right? There are spaces that exist uh, only in your mind. And, uh, you know, that, that is definitely uh, inspiring to me. That, that's what I want to explore, right? What, what can't you see? There you go, guys. <laughs>